So, and so um, basically the next step is to go through these, the, the Vachagota cycle. Maybe then I'll, we'll, I'll see if, if there are questions and then go to the next step. So we're gonna go through the Agi Vachagota Sutta, which is really one of my favorite texts. I keep, there's always more to write about it. And um, it begins with just to, I've been using the word formula a lot, just to make sure that you know what I mean. So here's the opening, eva me suttam. At one time, the Bhagavan was, so eva me suttam is already a formula, right? At one time, the Bhagavan was staying at Savati, at Jeta Grove, and Anathapindika's Rek Arama. So that's, an, that's another formula, but together they formed the opening formula. Then the, the wandering recluse, this is my, I don't know what to call it anymore, a paribajaka, Vachagota approached the Bhagavan, having approached, he exchanged blessing with the Bhagavan. This talk of blessing having passed pleasantly, he sat to one side, having sat to one side, the wandering recluse said this to the Lord, right? So just to, I mean, this is not the best example of an incredibly aesthetically packed, um, formula, right? But nevertheless, this opening is not in innocent. It already creates a clear hierarchy between the recluse and the Buddha and demonstrates how he's to be treated with care. Um, and, and just rehearsing this material has meaning in itself. Um, and, and the example I like best always, I actually spoke about this first at the Mangalam Institute in Berkeley, so it's kind of nice to recall it in the conference Natalie organized with Luis Gomez. Luis Gomez. Um, so, so there's a too early for alms formula, which is used only, only when the Buddha meets um, a, a Paribhajaka teacher. So if the Buddha goes to visit a Paribhajaka teacher, it will always be because he went for his alms round, alms round too early and he has some, some time to kill. And then, so this is already, you know, you, you see that there's like a literary image for the Paribhajaka teacher. And then one major way in which it, uh, uh, an encounter with the Paribhajaka teacher can proceed is that um, the Buddha will arrive and he, the Paribhajaka students are making a hell of a noise. They're talking about politics and about women and about armies and they're having fun. And then the Buddha comes up and the teacher says, quiet guys, the Buddha's coming, he likes quiet, we should be quiet. Maybe if we're quiet enough, he'll honor us with a visit. And then he'll come in and you know, and this can be elaborated on, you know, we can, he can, he can reappear from somewhere else. And, and I mean, there's, you can add more formulas into this method. And if, the, 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 if this is the way the, the discourse developed, the teaching that the Buddha will eventually give, part of important part of the genre, will reflect on the theme of silence and will highlight the deep silence that the Buddha achieves, that the other teachers, they just don't get it because they're in, in only interested in this outward behavior. So just to say that 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 um, um, you know these formulas, that, that's a better example of of of, of a more kind of pregnant formula that's saying a lot more and um, that also has a literary aspect to it. And really the play of formulas, I mean, there is, is based on an understanding that the early Buddhist texts are literature in the strong sense that the Bible is literature or that other types of literature are literature in the sense that people are telling stories. And we can talk about what I mean by literature later. I don't want to get into this. But if you think of Ajata Sattu in the Samanyapala Sutta sitting after he, we know he's killed his father and, he, and he's sitting on his balcony and it's the night of the full moon and his, his heart is all kind of, um, he's kind of sad or something. And he wants to get some prasada from some blessing, from inspiration from a religious teacher. And then they set out eventually after he, he denies the other teachers, they set out on the night of the full moon in this procession with blazing lanterns on 501 elephants, his 501. So this is like, you know, it's not reporting an historical event. It's, it's a literary text, right? So, so I'm not gonna say any more about that, but the background, it's important to know. Okay, just to make be clear that 
the Bhagavan went to meet, uh, Vachagota came to meet uh, um, Bhagavan, he came to meet the Buddha. And then he asks him the 10 unanswered questions, which are best known from the simile of the arrow, which I hope you all know. And um, it's the formulaic presentation of mistaken views. And he asked the Buddha if he thinks that the world is eternal or ephemeral, it has an end or doesn't, if the body and the jiva, call it, say, the soul, are the same or different. And it, if after the death, after death, the Tathagata exists, does not exist, both or neither. We could talk about this a lot. I've written about this in other places. It's not our theme today, but... Um, okay, let's say that here the Buddha denies the views. It's not like he won't answer them. They're not abhyakata. He says, I don't hold that view. This is not a denial of metaphysics here. It's an embracing of metaphysics because the point is going to be that the Buddha knows exactly what's going to happen to him when he dies and that the 10 views just don't define it well enough. Why not? Because language isn't fine enough. Language is based on the extremes of annihilation and, and um, uh, ucheda. I, I mean, uh, eternalism and annihilation, or we got to get normal terms for these, but right. Um, and then we can see this because the, the end of the discourse is with the simile of the fire. The Agi Vachagota, I should have said, is the discourse to Vachagota about fire, Agni, Agi. Um, and then the Buddha says that he that he's not reborn. Um, it, you can't say about him if he's reborn, not reborn, both or neither. Just like you can't say if the fire went after it's extinguished, extinguished went north, south, east or west. So um, you just can't say, but he knows what's going to happen to him after he dies. That's part of his attainment. So this really is a teaching of selflessness. The Ten Views are about selflessness. The Buddha does mention the problem of the views involving dukkha and not leading to quieting, to nibbana. See there, and, and here's, this is a nice formula, nani bidaya, naviragaya, nirodaya, upasamaya, vinyaya, sambodaya, nibanaya, right? It doesn't lead to detachment, doesn't lead to dispassion, doesn't need to lead to cessation. This is a list of terms we'll always find in this way or part of the terms, the first three come together. Okay, the point is the world in early Buddhism normally means the five aggregates. This is stuff that Rupert Gettin wrote years ago and Peter Harvey and um, other people. Um, and, and we'll see this in, in, in a minute. So the world eternal, the, if the world is eternal, the question means after death are the aggregates gonna continue? The world is anicca, um, impermanent means that they'll be annihilated. So the question really is what happens to people and especially to the Buddha after he dies. So it's like moving from a general question of the loka, of, of this world of experience, does it continue after death or does it evaporate, annihilate? And this is especially interesting in relation to the Buddha. And the answer the Buddha gives is this. So I've given up views because I've seen, concretely seen, Form, arising of form, iti rupam, iti rupa samudayo, iti rupa sa, e, samudayo, iti rupa sa tangamo. This is for, for, I've seen form, arising of form, passing away of form. He goes through the five aggregates. Um, and he's seen them come and go. Therefore, following the destruction of, I can't see because of the zoom, the dispassion toward the cessation of, the embedding of, the forsaken, the forsaking of, the probably the unarising of thoughts, of all thoughts, of all mental disturbances, of all the underlying tendencies, that's anusaya, to the pride, mana, of I and mine, ahankara, mamakara, the tatagai I say, is liberated. So you can see the, I mean, it moves, it's, it's a teaching about the five aggregates that, that are impermanent and that leads to forsaking I, I and mine. So it's a 
Selflessness is here an answer to the question of the afterlife. We can't speak of continuity in, in the afterlife in terms of satsataro jeda. And the analysis is made in terms of the aggregate. And this concrete perception uh, leads of impermanence of the aggregates leads to the relinquishing of all manita is thoughts, but it's kind of thoughts about myself. We'll see that later. Um, and underlying tendencies to the pride of I and mine. Okay, forget the Adina, but we'll talk about that. So basically to summarize this, and I mean, this could be debated theoretically, but it's not my point today. It's just, this is, this is just like the introduction to reading the Vachagota cycle. Is that what the Agi Vachagota teaches is that the 10 views are to be denied through an understanding of selflessness. Okay, 